Thank you. Genesis chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. And we heard about it this evening. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all of his work. Everybody say rested. 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 And so in the beginning, God created, God formed, he shaped with skill. He crafted out the heavens and the earth. We've been through it. He made something out of nothing. There was no explosion. There was no bing bag theory. God, in his creative genius, he made something out of nothing. And the word that we heard over and over this evening is the word create. And that word create that is used there to refer to God is an extremely powerful word. Because that word create does not refer to man taking um, wood and a hammer and saw and chisel and making a chair or making a table or making a desk. That word create is exclusively reserved for the divine. That word create is exclusively reserved for God at work. So in other words, only God can make something out of nothing. So when God spoke, God was doing a work that only God could do. Man can never do what God has done. Man can try to do what God has done. Man can come up with things that look like what God has done, may even sound like what God has done, but eventually it must fail because man does not have that creative genius that God had. And so we went through the six days and we look at God being the creator, and the Bible says something in that account. It says that that the waters were vast, And God hovered over the vastness and the emptiness of the water. And that's an interesting word. It it brings up the imagery of an eagle, for example, spreading her majestic wings and hovering over her chicks and brooding and protecting over her chicks. And as it were, God hovered, his spirit hovered over that which he knew he wanted to create. But that hovering there was not just a quiet hovering. That hovering was a hovering of action. That hovering, the word hovering there carries with it something called a a deep vibration. God was moving even though he was hovering. In our human minds, we might tend to think that he was still, but there was something that was going on in the spirit of God as God hovered. And whenever God hovers over nothing, he's about to create something. And if you want to experience transformation in our lives, let make sure that we come under the Spirit of God. Because when the Spirit of God begins to hover over us, God is about to bring order. He's about to bring something out of nothing. And so the Bible tells us that he hovered over the vastness of the water. And out of his hovering, God spoke. Out of his hovering, he said, let there be, and there was. What God was doing was that he was bringing order to that which was orderless. He was bringing boundaries to that which had no boundaries. He was bringing purpose to that which was seemingly without purpose. He was bringing function to that which looked as if it had no function. But as we went through it, everything had a function. When God created the heavens, there was a function. The sun has a function. The moon has function. The stars has function. The waters have, everything has function. And so you and I, we have function because as we just heard, day six was his best work ever. And God delights in life. And so from day three, we see God saying that it was good. And he could only say it was good because from day three was when life started to come about. Yes, in the plants that produce after their own kinds. But by the time God got to us at day six, we moved from being good to what? Being very good. And so God is an awesome God. And when God has created us, he knows exactly what it is he was doing. When the Bible talks about him forming us and knitting us together in our mother's womb in secret, God is at work bringing order to our lives. And so his hovering spirit, he hovered, and out of the hovering of his spirit, God spoke, and God repeated that pattern. For example, when he brought his children, his beings, out of Egypt, and he brought them out, his purpose, we heard it tonight, in bringing them out was so that they could do what? They could worship him. He gave Moses the instruction, go, tell Pharaoh, let my people go so that they can come into the desert and do what? Worship me. So God had designed us for worship. He had his people set apart for worship. And so what was interesting is that what God did right there, uh, God came down on the mountain, on, on top of the mountain, and the Bible says that he enveloped the mountain. 
There was darkness. There was thundering. There was lightning. God shook the mountain. When the Spirit of God comes, he comes and, and there's movement, the same movement that existed in the beginning when he hovered over the water. And what did he do in, the, in his thunderings and in his lightnings? He did something. He spoke. And when the Spirit of God comes, he speaks. He brings with him language. He talks to us. And the purpose of God speaking is to give us order, to give us direction, to give boundaries, to, to give us a safe place within which to operate. And so he had called these people out of Egypt, these people who um, they knew of God, it was passed on from generation to generation, but they had no idea how to interact with God, how to relate with God. They were without order, they were without structure, they were without boundaries. Anything went in Egypt. And the land to which they were going, anything went in Canaan as well. And so God had to give them order. And what did he do? He spoke. When God's spirit comes and God speaks, God's word gives us order. And so he gave what we know as the Ten Commandments. And when you look at the Ten Commandments that he gave to Moses, he was setting life in order for his people. And that's what God is about. He's about giving us order, giving us boundaries, giving us a framework within which we are to exist and fulfill the purpose that he created us to fulfill. So in the six days that followed from day one, as we've heard, God hovered, God spoke, God created, God saw that it was good from the third day down. He acknowledged that it was excellent. Day six was wonderful. He created man. He blessed man. He said, be fruitful and multiply, rule over the earth, subdue it. And then God arrived at day seven. God completed his work, not just of creation, but implicit in creation God completed putting the world in order and putting man in order. He completed setting the boundaries, setting the structures, giving direction. And then the Bible said God rested. He rested from all of this hovering, all of this movement, all of this speaking, all of this let there be and there was, all of this getting his hands into the soil and fashioning the body of man and then breathing the, his breath into that body. And so that body became a living being and then putting man to sleep a little later on and extracting a rib and fashioning woman. And then the Bible says that God rested. Do you think God was tired? Because I certainly will be tired. I'm, I'm, I'm tired right now. And I've only been speaking for about two minutes. <laughs> God wasn't tired because he is God. What was he doing? He was establishing a principle. He was setting something for us to follow. What was it that he was setting? He wasn't tired. He wanted to release one more aspect of order to man's life. And that aspect of order that God wanted to release was this. The concept of being set apart and the concept of being at rest. And I'm afraid that in our world, we've lost both of those concepts. We've lost the concept of being set apart unto him. And we've definitely lost the concept of resting. We confuse resting with sleep. Resting is not sleep. And sleep is not resting. Sleep is for the body. Rest is for the soul. Amen. And God established a concept. He established a principle of being set apart and also of resting. God rested. He ceased. He stopped his work. He was still. He was quiet. It was as if God took up a, a spiritual chair and he just sat down. And he rested. But in his resting, he rested in himself because he is God. He doesn't need a divan, a queen-sized bed, or a king-sized bed. But he simply rested in himself from all of the movement, all of the hovering, all of the speaking. And he was setting in place principles for you and I to follow. And you and I need to learn the concept of rest, and we're talking about do you want to hear God talk to you? And so God set apart the seventh day. He blessed it. He made it holy. He made it divinely unique unto himself. It was not like any of the other days. It was a day that was special, a day that God mapped out, a day that God wanted for himself. In other words, it was a day that he made specially his own 
for us to do like him, cease our work, cease our fussing, cease our stressing, cease our worrying, and be at rest. And the only place that we can rest, that's why I like standing by God, you see. The only place that we can rest is right here in God. But this is a little wrong. Because what God really wants to teach us when we rest in him, because we live in a world with so many challenges and problems and worries that they seem to come at us from all sides and get us down. But when God calls us to rest in him, he closes all of the gaps and we sit and we are completely at rest. And we can relax in the presence of God. Because he takes all of it. He takes all of the things that come against us. He takes all of the storms, all of the beatings. He can handle it. He doesn't need rest. He can handle it. We're the ones who need to rest. We're the ones who need to be recuperated and revitalized and replenished. And God says to us, rest in me. And so we have to remember to sit behind the presence and in the presence of God and be at peace. And when things happen... And I can ask Reverend Taylor, I can tell you about challenges happening. When things happen, even though we might freak out at first, that little God spot that we heard about just now, along with the Holy Spirit, reminds us that there is a God. And once we know that there is a God, this God, as we heard before, that breathed out stars, and spoke the Son into being, the one who told the sea to come this far and no further. That is the God that we can rest in. That is the God that we can be at peace in. That is the God that can bring our blood pressure down. That is the God that can keep us in the midst of everything that we've been through. And so the seventh day tells us about resting. You see, we were created in his image and his likeness, correct? And therefore, like God, we have a work to do. And our work as God's people, if you look around, we live in a very orderless world. We live in a world without boundaries, a world without um, structure, where the mantra, what is good, is to do whatever feels right, whatever tickles the flesh, whatever tickles the ears, we go with. There, there's nothing, and God has called us, the ecclesia, the called out ones, so that we cannot sit in a building and just feed ourselves. No, God has called us to go into that very orderless world and bring order. Bring order by how we live. Bring order by how we handle situations. Bring order by making disciples of others. But all of that work, all of that ordering, all of that structuring, all of that living for Jesus, all of that wrestling with demons and pulling down strongholds, etc., all of that leaves us what? Tired. <laughs> and so God says to us to rest. And so I want to ask a question. And I'm asking myself the question as well. How many of us really rest? How many of us really have a time that is separated unto God where we lay everything and everyone aside and we rest in the presence of God? You see, it is when we rest in the presence of God that that is when we really hear God talking to us. I, I kind of liken it to, to my relationship with, with my wife. Uh, this is... Well, this year will be 12 years that we've been married. And for Shelly, she loves when we have our alone time. Yeah, we love these guys. Um, but <laughs> she, she loves when we have our, our alone time. She thrives on that. I do too, but in a different way. But for, for her and for our relationship, uh, when we have time where we're just sitting, we're just talking, or we might just be going for a walk in the park or just going for an evening drive and, and we're, we're away from all of the phone calls and the WhatsApps and the BBMs and the text messages and all that. We're away from all of that stuff and we're just connecting one with another and we're just enjoying each other's presence, each other's company and we're just resting in one another. Even, we might even stop for ice cream, you know, and just lean on one another gently, etc. 
Do you know that that's when we have some of our most intimate conversations? That's when we begin to share hearts. That's when we begin to talk about dreams and talk about plans and, and what we would love to see and how God is operating in my life versus her life. That's even when sometimes challenges come up and in, in our counsel together, the, the wisdom of God comes forth and we're able to solve problems. It's the same thing with God. When we come away and we have our ice cream with God, try it, go have an ice cream with God. And, and, and we have our ice cream with God and we relax in him. That is the time we're going to get some of the most intimate conversations we've ever had with our creator. We have to be able to rest. We have to be able to turn off all of the technology. We have to be able to shut out all of the voices and simply be in the presence of the Lord. Then we're going to hear him speak in ways that he's never perhaps spoken to us before. Why? Because we now have time to listen. When we rest in God, a strength comes. When we rest in God, our souls are replenished. When we rest in God, our glasses are cleaned and that which once looked blurry now becomes clear. When we rest in God, all of the clutter that once confused and confounded our ears and our airwaves, all of that suddenly dies down and is still because in the presence of God, everything must bow to his authority. And if we are in the presence of God, he rules, he controls, and there's nothing that can penetrate that God wall. There's nothing that can get behind there. And when we are seated in the presence of God and we are at rest, there's such a refreshing and a sweetness that comes over our soul. We get perspective on life. Problems no longer seem so big or so so great when we consider the fact that we can sit in this God who breathes out stars that are times bigger than us and even though he's that big he loves us so much that he lives on the inside of us we serve an awesome God and if we learn to rest in him then we will become the people of God that he's meant us to be even young men grow weary and faint but they that wait upon the Lord, they that rest in the Lord shall do what? Renew their strength and do what? Mount up with wings like eagles. Eagles, remember the hovering example in the beginning when the spirit of the Lord hovered? God has placed an ability in us to become like eagles where we can rise above every storm, above every current, where we can sail over every situation. But we learn that as we rest in God. And so as I close, I went quickly because I know it's been a long night and I don't want to keep you here so that you poke your, your neighbor and tell them, wake up. I don't want to do that. And so I'm going to close here. I'm going to close by repeating the question that I asked earlier. Do we really rest in God? Are you troubled this evening? Are you facing an issue that seems really big, really challenging? I want to tell you that the same God we heard about from day one through to day seven is bigger than any issue you or I may face. I want to encourage you when you leave here, rest in him. Build that into your life. I'm working it into mine. I don't have it all together. Um, and when, when I don't rest in him, that's when I freak out. When I don't rest in him, that's when I lose perspective. When I don't rest in him, that's when I become short-tempered and grumpy. That's my son. Uh, when, but when I do rest in him, there's a peace that comes. And there's a perspective that comes. There's a joy that is always there. And guess what? You see the principle that was spoken about in terms of uh, reproducing after its own kind? Do you know that that's a God principle? Do you know that God is an agriculturist? That's a God principle. And the Bible talks about in Galatians chapter 5 about the fruit of the Spirit. Guess what? That fruit of the Spirit can only come from the Spirit who lives on the inside of us who can only do what? Reproduce after himself. And so he wants to reproduce himself in us 
And as we rest in him, he reproduces himself in us, and that comes out in our love, our joy, our peace, our long-suffering, our patience, our kindness, our gentleness, our meekness. All of that comes out. But the only way for that to come out is for pressure to be applied. And when pressure is applied, we then rest in him. And so God uses our trials, he uses our challenges, he uses our problems to do one thing. Not push us to suicide or depression, but push us into his presence. Because it's only when we are in his presence, when we are challenged, that we really know what lies on the inside. And so that's my word of encouragement to us tonight. Rest in the Lord. Can I pray with you? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this evening, Lord, for your goodness towards us. We thank you, Lord God, for the beginning of this wonderful conference. We praise you. We thank you for the high time we had in Zion, praising you and lifting up your name. We thank you, God, for each and every one of the speakers who, who marvelously portrayed your work in creation while yet making it relevant to us in 2014. And God, as we come to a close and end this evening of what is only but the first day of this conference, I pray, Spirit of God, that you would release such a divine peace over your people. I pray this evening, God, that we will learn how to rest in you. But before we learn how to rest in you, we will understand exactly who it is we are resting in. We will understand that you're the creator God. You are Yahweh. You're the one who pulls something out of nothing. You're the one who can look at nothing nothing and speak and say let there be and there was and so God what is man that you are mindful of him but God you so love us that we are the only ones in creation that you had a counsel with yourself about you said let us make man in our image and so Elohim the singular God of Israel expressed as God the Father God the Son and God the Holy Spirit had counsel and decided to make us in his very image and so there's something wonderful about us there's something special about us, not in ourselves, but because of our Creator. And so we bless you this evening, Creator God. We worship you this evening. We exalt you this evening. We adore you this evening. God, we lift you up this evening. We declare that you are wonderful. You are excellent. We give you a high note of praise, God, because you are worthy to be praised. Great is our God and greatly to be praised. We magnify your name, the King of glory. God, you are worthy. You are worthy to be praised. God and we will not let the rocks cry out in our place even though they have good reason to but God we the ones who were created in your image we cry out God and we say blessed be the name of the Lord be magnified and be glorified and God you see every uplifted hand you see every heart God whether persons are seated or standing this evening you know where we are at and I pray in the name of Jesus as we learn to rest in you that the spirit of the living God will so infuse us and so fill us that we will hide in the shadow of the Almighty and we will know that when we are abiding under the shadow of the Almighty that nothing can come near our dwelling we will understand that no weapon that is formed against us shall prosper but God we give you the praise and we give you the glory this evening we magnify your name oh God so, Father God, I ask, God, that you would kiss us with your peace and you will kiss us with your presence and God as we leave this place that we will rest knowing that God you are still on the throne that nobody built your throne or made your throne for you you are a throne all in yourself you are God the earth is your footstool God you are wonderful you are excellent Lord God we fail in our words to describe an indescribable God but Father we give you thanks that you love us enough to draw us onto yourself and to release your peace and your guidance and your word over us because it is your word that brings order. It is your word that sets structure in our lives. It is your word that gives us safe boundaries to operate in. We thank you Lord God for your word. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Just one more thing. Is there anyone here this evening that you don't know this God we're talking about? You don't know Jesus. You've not really received him into your heart. 
this will be a good night, a good time to start. Not by giving your life to the church. You give your life to Christ and you become the church. The church is not buildings and programs and institutions. The, the, the church, the people, the called out ones. So if you're here this evening and you don't know Christ, I can't think of a better way to start this conference than by giving it all to Jesus. And so if there's anyone here, or you knew him, perhaps, or you used to walk with him, but life got in the way, stuff happened. And before you knew it, you were far away from God. If that's you, would you stand so I can pray with you? and lead you to the Heavenly Father. Anyone here tonight? We believe in God for salvation. We believe in God for souls to be saved. And, I, and if you're here and you, aren't, you haven't quite yet made the decision, that's all right. But I pray that by the end of this conference, that the Spirit of the Lord will so convict you as to the reality and the awesomeness of God, that you will feel as if you have no choice but to surrender your life to Him. And so you may not be ready as yet, that's all right. But I pray the covering of God over you. I pray God's protection over you. And I pray also that God will not leave you alone. I pray that he will make you uncomfortable. Sounds interesting, huh? But I pray that he will make you uncomfortable to the point where you have no choice but to come on your knees, bow your knees before him. You see, I would rather bow now. I would rather bow now so that I can guarantee that I hear well done at the end of my time than being forced to bow at the end of my time and hear depart from me for I know you not. And so I pray that the Spirit of the Lord will help you whoever you are to make that decision between now and the end of the conference. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you. Thank you for having me. Greetings from Barbados. Greetings from my home church, greetings from my wife and my daughter. My son is here. It's wonderful to be with you for these next few days. Thank you to Reverend Taylor, Reverend Greenwich, and all of the youth team. And we'll see what God does over the next few days. Amen? To God be the glory.